I will briefly introduce you to the to our institute or the history of our, of our institute and to the past activities that our institute carried out in Antarctica. Then I will briefly introduce our topics and our project. So the IFAC history is a little bit weird because this guy with another with another professor of which was called Hugo Tiberio. They worked with the uh, Italian Navy. And in uh, 1930s, they invented the radar. We were between the two worlds, so we didn't have such a huge research activity like in the current times. So every country developed the radar by itself. The US, the Russian, the English, and also the Italian. This guy developed this and the other develop a new instrument. They say this new instrument, it has a strange name, a good name, I don't remember it, can be used to see the ship at night, but the generals of the Navy say we don't mind it because we fight the wars during the day. So they block the development of the radar. The Italian lost the war in the 50s, they did this instrument that was the first Italian radar, working radar, and in 46 he founded the microwave center. At the time the microwave were the most interesting topics, more than us the laser. It was really advanced. Then we had other scientists like this Giuliano Torado di Francia that they introduced the laser that at the time they were very famous. In the 68 the microwave center became the Institute for Research of Electromagnetic Waves. And then in the last year, we have the new IFAC Institute of Applied Physics. Because, I mean, the microwaves are something routine. Everyone knows about, knows about microwaves, but everyone uses microwaves. We have the Owen, we have the telephone, we have the cable TV. So microwaves are very routine stuff. Also, the laser is became very routinely used, so we move. This is today the building. We are part of the National Research Council of Italy. The major topic are not anymore the microwave for communication and radar system, but right now we are on laser, biophotonics, micro optics, sensor, remote sensing, micro and ECT mainly focused on the environment and on the health, uh, I mean, all, all, all over the health topics. Uh, the last two bigger points are, the, the bigger topics are the use of laser to cure the cancer and the use of microwaves and higher frequency for the environment. These are the bigger topics of the main so go ahead. And the Institute of Applied Physics has been active in, the, in Antarctica since the 90s, early 90s. This is an experiment carried out with the geophysical airplane. The experiment was called Apegaia, which means airborne Control Experiment Geophysical Aircraft in Antarctica. This is a Russian spy airplane. It was, it should have been the the colleague of the U2, more or less they are the same. It's a stratospheric, not pressurized uh, airplane, and it was used to take measurement of the Antarctic troposphere to study the hole in the ozone. Because in the 90s we have this huge problem about the hole in the ozone. So they use this airplane. This airplane has some bay here. They actually has every spy airplane, they don't carry any weapons. So they have a reconnaissance uh, instrument here. And they take out everything and put some instrument for the atmosphere. The instrument started from, I mean, the airplane take out from Ushuaia, which is the southern point of the South America. It lasts for 10, one month, was funded by the European Union and the Italian program for research in Antarctica. Nine countries participated to the campaign and these were the flights. Actually 
they didn't take any measurements during the flight or very few because their interest was in the vertical profile. So they reached something like uh, 50,000 feet and they jump below. And during the vertical, almost vertical uh, transit, they collect measurements. That's why here we have very few spots. This is where the transit, where they collect the measurements. The other big, the other big project, uh, project in which we have involved in the past was the boomerang experiment. Boomerang was very famous because it was the first experiment that measured the anisotropy in the cosmic background. So it was called boomerang because I don't have it because they launched from close to McMurdo the balloon, and due to the circulation. The Antarctic circulation of the atmosphere, the air, the balloon returned over McMurdo and they collect the data. That's why it's called boomerang. Now have the they have these are the measurements. They fly in the end of the 90 at an altitude of 120,000 feet. This was the gondola. Actually, here IFAC has a margin roll, but we designed the pointing system for three or four instruments because they have, they have a star tracker and some other pointing instruments. So here we designed just the attitude <coughs> control of the gondola. <coughs> so came into the micro remote sensing. These are the, uh, the components of our group. Everything started with Paolo Pampaloni in the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, when he was very a liberal people, and he was in touch with a lot of Russia. Then he, s he knows that the Russian use radiometer to uh, measure the brightness temperature and the emission of the, of the bodies. And he was with the Archetri uh, radio I mean, the Archetri Observatory. In Archetri, they have a radio telescope they were able to turn the radius telescope towards the ground, almost towards the ground, and to measure the emission of the hills in front. This was the first, probably the first measure, microwave measurement carried out in Italy. Because at that time we didn't have any money, and what we can do was to give this measurement at the end of the 80s, about the 70s, 70s. So, starting from Paolo Pampaloni, researching this topic, we had that to nowadays. So uh, the micro remote sensing group had now has an experience in developing micro scattering and emission models, also on the retrieval algorithm for estimating land parameter because our main topics were uh, soil moisture, uh, vegetation biomass, and snow, terrestrial snow. I mean, until the 2000, when we start to move towards Antarctica. Then we uh, also we have a lot of experience in field experiment and in the last year, I mean, analysis of satellite data in the development of the Grand and Airborne System, because up to now there are very few companies in the world that produce radiometers, very, very few. And they are very, very expensive. So if you have some heritage, it's better to build the radiometer. It's much less expensive. Also, uh, we have some experience in the production of thematic map of this parameter, which are really interested to the local government and to the European government, because right now, with the development of the GIS, everyone is interested in every map, map to be put together and to exploit this data. These are our instrument built on the boom. Here are for measuring the popular emission. Here, this was an, uh, an experiment on the Italian hubs for the measure the refreezing of the snow. And these were the instrument put on the Salam, which, which is uh, a French airplane. These were other, uh, okay, better slide for our experimental campaign that Base in 2000 over the Italian Alps, and I will talk about more later. 
So microwave in remote sensing. First of all, microwave. But why microwave? Because a lot of people prefer optics because optics is much more clear. Everyone can interpret uh, an optical images. It's so clear. You take the photo, you look at the photo, and it's done. <coughs> so microwave. Uh, in the, with the term microwave, we say we refer to this part of the spectrum. Here we have the optical spectrum. And we refer usually to wavelength that goes from one meter to one centimeter. This is more or less the wavelength that we consider for the microwave. The advantages of the microwave. Microwave data can be collected day and night without any problem. Are collected all weather. I mean, except in this part of the spectrum, we don't have any much problem with the rain, with the clouds, with anything. We don't have any problem. And also, they give you an information which is complementary to the optical and infrared data. The active system, the radar, are very clear how they work. They send a train of waves and they measure the heat. So it is quite clear the concept of the radar. A lot of people do not understand how a passive system works. So everybody emits energy because they are not at uh, zero Kelvin. If you are not at zero Kelvin, the Planck law say that you emit energy. Very few, very, very few, but you emit it. I mean, unless you are at higher temperature. If you warm a piece of iron, you can see uh, when it reaches one, yeah, 1400 Kelvin, you can see the iron because iron start to emit in the optical wavelength you see the iron, which is yellow. Below, you cannot see that it is yellow. You have to see it in the infrared, because it's emission decrease. But since everybody can emit microwave, at the wavelength, uh, let magnetic wave, we can measure that. So why microwave is known? Because the microwave, as I say, are independent from the environmental condition, but they are sensitive to the Sweet, which is the snow water equivalent of the snow, because they are sensitive to the liquid water content, because they are sensitive to the temperature, I mean, at least for the passive case, because they are sensitive to the snow layering and to the, and to the snow grain sites. This can be sometimes good and sometimes not good influence, pro and cons, but more or less, these are the reason why it is interesting to start the snow with the microwave. So why, how do we get to Antarctica? Because it was not so clear. We didn't get to Antarctica to study Antarctica. This is the reason. In Antarctica, has some weird physical processes. I mean, at least in the interior part of the plateau here, this is the peninsula, McMurdo, the Italian base, Durmond Durbit. At least on the plateau, you have very light snowfall. Sometimes you don't have at, at all the snowfall. In Concordia, which is almost here, you have an accumulation. We say accumulation, it's not snowfall, it's accumulation because the snow is redistributed. We have 10 centimeters each year, very, very few. The temperature of the snow below 10 meters is constant. I mean, constant in time, it changes in depth, but it's constant in time along the, I, I can say, centuries. So there are a lot of processes that are constant in the long time, in the long term. The other consideration is that we have a lot of satellite in polar orbit that can imagine, can image Antarctica every couple of hours. You can have data really every three, four hours. With the AMSAR E, the Japanese radiometer, you can have over Concordia eight images per day, seven images per day. So you, you can have a huge amount of data. Even because every 15 minutes, this satellite passes over Antarctica. So the idea that some people in ESA, the European Space Agency, had was why not to use Antarctica and its properties to calibrate the, the spaceborne satellite sensor. Because 
this was the idea. You have processes that doesn't change in the long term. You have satellite that passes there every, I mean, every day. So if something changes in your observation over Antarctica, means that your sensor is not working properly. That was the idea at the beginning. So when in yeah, yeah, in, in 2000, in between 2000 and 2010, ESA was developing, was developing this sensor, which is called SMOS, a moisture and ocean salinity sensor. The name explains itself, it's explicative about the topic of the mission. The internal band radiometer, it measured the emission in the band of the hydrogen. It has 24 centimeter wavelength and can penetrate the snow for 200, 300, 400 meters. It depends. So it goes sensing a part of the snowpack that didn't change, whose temperature didn't change, and whose properties didn't, didn't change. So that's why they believe that Antarctica could be a good place for calibrating this instrument or at least uh, to check if the <coughs> instrument works. So they asked, <coughs> since we had a uh, heritage, if we can go there, because I don't see right now there is the Italian French base of Concordia, so we are allowed to go there, and to characterize the emission of the platform. So since uh, the 2004, we take out, we carried out three experiments, called Domics 1, 2, and 3, but we don't have too much fantasy Experiment. They last for one month, two years, and the last is lasting since 2012, 2014. So are, we have four years of data, but they are still running. We are collecting continuously data 24 7. We have winter over people right now that are able to manage the instrument if they have some fault or there's some problem. So we are collecting measurement here. One point, why don't see? Because don't see is in a very privileged place. We are at 75 degrees south, so we have a lot of overpasses of the satellite. Over the plateau, the snow surface is statistically homogeneous at 100 km scale, more or less. Everything is flat, so the topography is known. We have a, a, a automatic weather station measurement continuously from two or three sides. We don't have too much snow accumulation. So everything is keep, doesn't change. We have a very small surface roughness. And this is Dom Si. So Dom Si is very, very, uh, and it's a boring place. Actually, if you go there, you don't have too much to enjoy. You don't have the landscape. This is the view from the tower. We are at 3,000 kilometers, a little bit more, eight, a meter, eight height. We have a pressure which is equivalent to 4,000 meters, and this causes a lot of problems to the people, especially in the first week, because people is not usually common people is not used to live at this altitude. And the, everything that you do is very tiring. Also because they put the canteen at the third level of the base, so every time you have to go <laughs> to the third level, it's kind of boring. The temperature is quite low. On average, minus 50, you can reach here on average towards the maximum minus 23, but in the last year we have reached minus 18 Celsius. The temperature are rising very, very fast in, uh, in the plateau. 10 years ago, we didn't, barely we could reach minus 20. Right now, it is common to reach minus 18. So the temperature are rising very, very fast. But also, the minimum temperature is not anymore, on average, minus 78. It is well below. So everything changes there. This was the setup. This was the US tower that was built there, I don't know when, probably when, when before the, setting of the, the settlement of the base. This was the, our, first, our first instrument that we used in 2002. We painted it in black because we say in Concordia it is so cold that we need the help of the sun to eat the instruments. Then we discovered that with 
half of the pressure that we have at this, at this level, we don't have any dissipation. So inside the instrument get to 60 degrees Celsius. They are boiling. So we learned the lesson and the instrument in the following year was black, white, completely white. Actually, we are planning to, hope to uh, open some holes because during the summer we can still reach, we are still reaching 50 degrees Celsius inside with everything turned off, I mean, except under the limit. So. This is an example of the brightness temperature that we measure. As we can see, the depolarization, as expected, is very, very stable. We have a standard deviation of 0 0.39 Kelvin. Different is the case of the H polarization, because the H polarization is sensitive to the layering of the snow. So if you have something that changes the layering of the snow, you have fluctuation like this. Also, this is not, is not noise. This is the effect of the sun. Here we are during the summer. When the sun passes in front of the radiometer, we are measuring the emission of the sun reflected by the snow. So that's during the summer, you have a fluctuation. Then they start to disappear. During the winter, you don't have any fluctuation. You have similar data of the depolarization, mm -hmm. and they start to reappear in the summer later. However, the brightness temperature is quite stable. This is what we should we should do. What we do for ESA, the comparison between their data, which are this noisy data there. There is a reason for the noisy data and power. This, this is an example of six months in 2014. But, I mean, the radiometer seems to, both radiometer works quite fine, both of them. However, however, there are some reasons. So the, 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 the good, the bigger question mark was, if everything is stable, why you keep on going there? Because we know it. And everything is stable. This was the biggest question mark that we had seven years ago. And this is the reason. OK, the depolarization is stable. In 2015, we saw this huge drop on the H polarization. So this huge drop in H polarization is caused by the sunlight that did the work or something that happens on the target. Because this was the big question mark for them. So this is the reason why it is interesting to keep on monitoring. Because if we are able to independently explain the measurement, or at least to say, no, your measurements are correct, this is a proof for the mission. Actually, right now, the idea is to provide a long-term record of measurements for both the ESA sense, but also for the NASA one, because NASA launched the Aquarius mission that stopped work last year, and it take four years of data, and right now there is the SMAP mission. So everyone is interested to this data. So behind the technical reason why we, get, we, we go there, why, which is the scientific reason to go there, because we have also scientific reason. So here we have this drop because we had a strong wind heavens. So L-band, it is true that it is not sensitive too much to the surface because it is sensitive sensitive to a huge layer of snowpack there. But if you have a strong wind habit, you can see it. So in some way, you have to be very accurate, but in some way, you can see something that happens on the surface. These are the Aquarius data collected by NASA. SMOS data average collected by ESA. All measurements without the sun. And this is the meteor data from the ADS, the wind speed. So what you can see here is that, at least from our measurement, this sudden drop happens because you have a strong wind events. Also, there is another small drop here, another here, and we have wind. Also strong, I mean, changes in wind. These are 
measurement of the answer to, which is a Japanese microwave sensor, not at 20 centimeter wavelength, but at 6 centimeter wavelength. But you can see also these drops, which is the same. I mean, this is the reason, the explanation that we gave. In Concordia, you have, you don't have any snowfall. At almost you don't have it. You have a lot of redistribution of snow due to the wind. The prevailing wind came from south, almost 180, 200 degrees of altitude. When you have strong winds, the winds start to blow and you have a lot of snow transportation between from the south towards the north uh, that lasts for days. You have a, a lot of transportation. During the transportation, the wind is able to break, break down the snow crystal to create, and we measure them, to create layers from one centimeter or two centimeter thick of compact and very hard snow. Even because it seems that everything is flat, actually uh, the landscape is like the sea when it is slightly rough. And after any steel waves, the snow accumulates. And this tiny crystal, broken crystals, no accumulates and get compact and compact and compact. And this caused a changes in the first layer of snow. This was the explanation that we and the people in LGJ in France gave this phenomenon, more or less. The other point, this is Concordia. The idea was we have data all over Antarctica. Why not find another place, maybe bigger, to calibrate this sensor. This is Aurora Basin, a huge spot. This is a, as it is seen by SMOS, there is a sensor. This is by, as it, it, is, it was seen by the Aquarius sensor of NASA. They, uh, okay, they measure the same stuff, more or less. This is the comparison that we get in Concordia. This is the compared with much more data of the Aurora Basin with over, uh, with the two sensors. Actually, here you have fissures that you cannot monitor because the base is here and we don't have any base inside of the other base. But there are also other places that can be monitored for the calibration topic. Behind the calibration, looking at the, uh, at the, cry at the cryosphere. So this is a map of the average brightness temperature over Antarctica. You can see that there are a lot of fissures here. It's not, if you put attention, it's not homogeneous, but you have fissure. The standard deviation of the measurements are quite stable. Here we are talking about one degree. The red, the red is one, dig, one Kelvin. So we are quite stable. But if we look in detail, we can see some fissure. This is Lake Bostock. We, here we have the ridge. This is Lake Bostock. So SMOS can see something related to Lake Bostock. But, but Lake Bostock is on the bottom of the ice sheet, below 3 kilometers of ice, more than 3 kilometers of ice. But we do not penetrate until 3, three kilometers. So why we can see these fissures? Why we can see Lake Bostock? Actually, Lake Bostock can be seen also in the SAR C-band data which has a short wavelength, a shorter wavelength. So we start to analyze the data. We took 10 years to explain it. These are airborne data, this is Concordia Station, airborne data collected over Concordia Station by the Danish Technical University. This is the bedrock below Concordia Station, below the Aurora Basin, I mean. So we start to see some similarity from here there are some similarity, also this triangular shape. These are the SMOS measurements, like similar. So we analyze a couple of transects through, through the Aurora Basin and towards Lake Post. These are the measurements. This is the ice thickness. This is the surface temperature collected by MODIS. And this is the signal of SMOS. 
what we saw at the beginning is that, at least in the first part, we have a very uniform surface temperature. The ice thickness increased and the signal almost decreased. If we move here, ice thickness is almost constant. Surface temperature increased, so it's most increased. So there was a reason why we, there should be a reason why these are linked. Vostok was the same in the first part. Stable surface temperature, ice thickness that increased, it's most decreased. Here, surface in the temperature increase, high thickness decrease, small increase. Over the coastal clays, lake, the high thickness is almost constant. You have a drop, a slightly drop in surface temperature of the snow and small decrease. So the interpretation, we use this, it's quite old model developed by Leon Sang when it was probably at the MIT at the time. A lot of time ago. And we use this model just to try to explain the data. As input, we use the snowpack temperature profile, the snowpack density profile, the grain radius profile, even if it doesn't have any influence on the air band, but it has on the C band, the direct higher frequencies, and the layer profile. This was the medium as we modeled. Here we have the basalt, we hypothesize both ground or water, but it's the same. We don't have any changes. What it is interesting is, the, is that the first part, I mean the first 80 meter, yeah, 80 meter is composed by snow. That means you have a mixture of air and ice, but that from the modeling point of view can be seen as ice crystal in, embedded in air. When you go above, below, I mean beyond, critical point, which is around 500 kilo, kilograms per cubic meter, you have to see air in ice from the modeling point of view. It changes. Actually, it doesn't have too much effect on the emission, but this what was what we have to account. Okay, let's go ahead, let's go ahead. As a temperature, we use these stupid model that it has a seam just to account for the seasonal shift in the top five meter of temperature for the first meters. And then we use the Robin model developed in the 56 just to account for the brightness temp so the vertical temperature profile of the snow. For the density profile, the density increase as we go towards the bottom but it has some fluctuation. So we try to fit some models, some data. These are data collected in the first 50 meter. We can see that the fluctuation, are more, I mean, we, you don't have too much fluctuation below 50 meters. So we interpolate this data. This data came from the oral paper and also from a lot of measurement that in the past the Italian program performed it around Concordia. This is the fit, the, the fit, uh, the fit of all fluctuation compared to, I mean, data colored by these two papers. We use for the layering because the layers in Concordia are bigger on the top and they get thinner and thinner as the, uh, we go deep towards the ground. Everything took place I mean the first 50 meter, then you reach 80 meter, then you reach the density of the ice. So using the mass continuity, we computed the thickness of the ice that we sampled. This was the reason. After 10 years, we could have, we have been able to explain the angular trend of the brightness temperature measurements. So in the end, what happens? is that the vertical profile of temperature in, in, the, in the Antarctic plateau drive the emission of the snow. The emission is constant, so, sorry, no, this is not true. The emission is constant and the brightness temperature is driven by the temperature profile in Antarctica. Using the same model over the transect, we have been able more or less to reproduce the small 
The other point, but I want to skip this, we don't have Other point, ground measurements. We have project there since 2004. This was an interesting point. This guy was a snow scientist. He used to live on the Alps, so he's well trained. He works for the avalanche prevention and monitoring. So he, in uh, one month, he dig a 20 meter long trench. A two meter deep. One meter per day, and he dig this huge trench in the clean area of Concordia close to the base. The idea was to take ear image, infrared image with a camera and to see how the layers behave along this long trench. Because the idea, usually we, we say that you have flat layers over the Antarctic plateau and these flat layers can be modeled and they do not impact too much on the brightness temperature. But what it is covered by analyzing just the not calibrated air image is that you have some layers that are like pillows. Pillows and pillows and pillows and pillows. So the idea of modeling the brightness temperature as flat layers, I mean, it in, as a first attempt, it's OK. But if you want to be more precise, you was not true anymore. Also, is work, but I didn't put it here, was to characterize at least the first centimeter, the one meter part, the, the snow at around one meter, and the snow around two meter. The characteristic, just to say, in the top, we have this kind of measure, this kind of snow crystal. In the medium, we have this other kind of snow crystal, because all of the energy exchanges took place in the first meter, two meter, more or less. So everything changes here. So if you are able to characterize in the winter and in the summer these two changes, you are able to obtain some very nice information about the process that took to them. What we did this year? This year we came back another time. We use still an infrared camera, but we have some calibrated target so we can say which the reflectance is. It's not an, in, an uncalibrated measurement, but <coughs> what we did? We did several snow <coughs> feet, uh, something like 10 feet, 9, 10 feet, 9, 6, 7 feet deep. And we imaged the entire walls. The walls of the snow pit were not casually chosen, but we dig the pits, I mean, oriented along the prevailing wind direction, just to see the effect of the deposition of snow along and across the deposition of the wind. This is an example of a transit. We have to mosaic a lot, and we are still processing the data, a lot of these profile just to have the entire wall. This is the reflectance. This is the SSA parameter. SSA is the specific surface area, which is a parameter related to the grain dimensions. So here we can see the is inverted related. So the highest, the SSA, the smallest the grain. So here we can see that the smallest grain are on top. And as you go towards the bottom, they increase. But this is not true. What is interesting is that sometimes you have very compact layer of snow alternated to layer of snow with big uh, with different snow grain because the compact layer of snow block the water transmission, the water transport. It block the water transport and the metamorphism take place between a couple of layers dense. So we have also this effect and we can see clearly the layers which better here than here. So the idea also was to see how they changes laterally and across the wind direction. Sorry, along and across the wind direction. 
current activities, right? I almost finished. We have at present the ESA want to uh, exploit their time series of advanced measurements all across the scientific topic as possible, not only for soil moisture and ocean salinity, but there are a lot of studies to exploit advanced data for the sea ice, for the biomass. We are the PI of the of a project to exploit this most data for the cryosphere in Antarctica. Not the Arctic, but in the Antarctic. So the case study were for just to try to obtain some product about the vertical profile here in the plateau where everything is constant. Because if the emission changes with a single frequency, we are not able to say anything. Two, see the influence of the ge uh, geothermal heat flux and the bed in the bed of topography on the brightness temple. These are very strictly related. To characterize the ice shell, the, the University of Hamburg has a long tradition of sea ice monitoring. Right now, they are developing the ESA product for the sea ice thickness estimation. And it's the first product available, I guess, since ever. Because up to now, we can monitor where the ice is, where the sea ice is, but not how much the sea ice thickness is. And this is very important for the commercial route. And a lot of European countries are pushing money just because they want to know where the ship has to pass. They are right now producing a product that is able to detect the sea ice up to more or less effectively, 30 centimeters. So using longer wavelength could be a good idea to see, OK, we are able to estimate the thickness of the sea ice up to one meter. This could be a good point for the future. Maybe, I don't know, since it is not a scientific point, is a, is a money. And there is the interest of the company to develop the product. So this could be interesting for the future, the use of longer wavelength for the sea ice. Here they are in charge to characterize the ice shelf, one, two, and three, the Emery, the, Ro the Ross, and the weather season. Also, the last, the last case study was the characterization of the surface processes that took place, especially here, especially along the coast. And the first one is the melting and refreeze, the initial of the melting season, and the end of the melting season, and the melting events along the coast. And also the uh, brine formation over the bottom. You will be that project. This is much more interesting for you. So this is a project led by Joy, or led by also. It's a project funded by NASA in the East in uh, EET uh, instrument computer program. The idea was develop an innovative radiometer that can measure the brightness temperature over a wide band from 500 megahertz until 2 gigahertz, being able to mitigate or detect the radio frequency interference, and whose temperature should be used for estimate the vertical temperature of the ice sheet. It should be, am I right? <laughs> you got it. OK, so this is the topic. This uh, the, uh, instrument will fly next fall, almost next fall over Greenland, because actually fly over Antarctica would have been more interesting, but it is much more difficult to get to Antarctica than to get to Greenland. Here, last year we had a first campaign with this prototype in Concordia. Just to see what a four band microwave radiometer instead of the real 12, 13 that will fly, what a four band radiometer can see there. I was in charge of the Antarctic campaign. Usually in Italy you cannot bring, I mean, for the Italian program you cannot bring an instrument there because they get mad, really, really mad. You have to apply a competitive process. But 
since we are already collecting measurement at the bank, we say that we are interested to see a comparison. And we were allowed. <laughs> this was the radiometer in the calibration phase looking at the sky, which is the theoretical background. So as I said before, this is the formula that can more or less represent the vertical profile of the temperature inside of the ice sheet, in which you have changes of geothermal heat flux, or geothermal heat flux, but you don't have any lateral advection. Because if you have lateral advection, this formula do not apply anymore. Changes in the, in the snow accumulation, changes in the geothermal heat flux, and in the thickness of the ice that lead the ice sheet to have different vertical temperature profile. The vertical temperature profile also need lead to different spectrum measurements. These different spectrum measurements can be inverted and can be, uh, and, and at least for the moment, with synthetic data, we have been able to estimate more or less the vertical profile of the ice sheet. The goal is one Kelvin every 100 meter, if I'm right, more or less. This was the estimation. The Antarctic campaign, okay, lasted for a lot of time, something like one month and a half, but actually we acquired nine days of data on the ground. This was the instrument deployed on the ground this was radomics or radiometer. We collected also sky measurement and nadir and after nadir. We have the matched load, the, the matched load measurement just for calibration. These are some nice pictures. Here you have the receiver, we have the black cable. This was the antenna looking at the ground. So this is much more clear what we did. This was during the installation. These were just a sample of the data. Here, the data are noisy because they are not completely calibrated. Also, we have to complete the RFI compensation. But what we saw is that for the sky, almost everything is OK. We have negative value, but because the cable, was not the cable losses are not compensated, and so we have to work on them. But we have at least differences between 45 and 30 degrees, different with respect to DOMEX. So we have good chances for the future campaign to have good data. Also, behind all of these instrument development, there are also activities carried out at the University of Michigan on the modeling. There are activities of the retrieval carried out also by Mike here and also by uh, Kaglar, who worked on it, and uh, the OSU, and the future activities, just to close it. We are planning on the extension of the DOMEX experiment because when we start digging the data, we found very interesting features in the data. So it's worth to exploit the data, not just for calibration, but also to see if it is possible to find something scientific. We have already submitted a proposal to the Italian research program to fly uwb rad over sea ice in Antarctica and over the ice sheet because we have common flights. Usually we have a lot of flights between the coastal base of Mario Zuccheri Station close to McMurdo towards Concordia. So since we are allowed a lot of airplanes, there are a twin other, a Basler, they have also three helicopters, this year four. So we have a lot of logistic needs. So we say, why not to fly the UWB rad on the CIS, IPS shelf, and also the interior. The other project that, this is a little bit, I don't want to say more interesting, but quite new. The idea is to drill a hole of 100 centimeter deep, 100 meter deep. 100 meter means that you go to the surface until the ice because at 100 centimeter, the snow is so compact that it has reached the ice, the ice density. So we dig a hole, we take, a, we take the, 
the ice sample, we take out the ice sample, we can measure the dielectric properties in the same band of the ice because we don't have up to now good measurements, at least in Antarctica for sure, of the dielectric properties that drive the emission and the scattering in this band. We perform the measurement on the core, but also we send a receiver inside of the hole. We put a transmitter on a sledge and then we perform the attenuation. So we can be, I don't want to say sure, but we can have a proof how much deeper we can go with these waves. So this is another proposal submitted to PNRA. We hope to be successful. <laughs> this was after having covered again this no pit. <laughs> because you are not allowed to leave this no pit open. You have to be respectful for the environment. So any question? Thank you very much.